Hello, everybody. Say hello. I'm sure you've already been doing that. Say hi in the chat. And I see people are telling us where you are watching from Indianapolis and Texas and all the good things. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to spend a Tuesday evening with you. Beautiful. So good. We're going to give people a second to find out that we're here. And, uh, and hello, did anybody eat anything delicious for dinner? Did anyone eat anything yummy? Tell me in the chat while we're waiting. Sarasota, Australia, Vermont, hello. roasted chicken. Yum. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for being such good participants. Um, sushi, that's my favorite food. Taco Tuesday, of course. Of course it is. Why wouldn't I have not thought of that? Um, and Macy's also eating veggie tacos, pad thai, delicious. Um, oh my God, Maureen is in Hong Kong. Hello, good morning to you over there. Of course you're having coffee. How could you live without it? I don't know how I could. Pasta with white mushroom sauce, fresh local peach, delicious. It's not quite dinner time on the West Coast. You're right, that's true. You had a vegan just egg scramble for lunch. So healthy of you. Look at me. Look at me over here with green juice. <laughs> I'm showing off because the truth is I hardly ever do this, but I need, I need to get some juice in me because, because there's a, there's a pandemic and I probably should be healthy, um, healthier than normal ricotta and spinach tortellini. Awesome. Awesome guys. Well, we're going to get started. I'm so happy to be spending this time with you. And um, we'll just give everybody another second to, to come on in. So what green juice am I drinking? Okay, this is so yummy. Celery, apples, pineapple, cucumber, spirulina, coconut water, and lemon. Why don't I actually open it? <laughs> so I actually will drink it. Um, so let me ask you this, um, type a one in the chat if this is your first time hanging out with me, doing any kind of like workshop. Oh my God, hello, new friends. Thank you for coming. You don't know what you're in for. No, I'm just kidding. That's great. So fun, hello. <laughs> Brooke's like, this is my one million time. Okay, so I love you. I haven't scared her away. Mm. And how many of you type a two in the chat if you listen to my podcast, my podcast, which is the same title as this book. Don't keep your day job. Don't do that. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to have a day job when you can live your life's work? Ah, it feels so good just to say it. it feels so good just to say it out loud. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for that. Thank you for listening to the show. It really is unbelievable how it's completely changed my life, completely changed my life. I was just a girl who barely, literally barely found out, found out the day of graduation from high school that my teacher was going to change a grade so that I could actually graduate. And to have now 24 million downloads of a podcast in four years, this is a crazy thing. It's such a big, giant, big, giant bowl of blessing. Um, and then for all of my, all of my, I see some of our students here for me to do this. Um, tell us with a three, type a three in the chat if you are in one of my programs or you're an alumni of one of my programs. Hello, I love you guys. You guys, it's like um, Band of Brothers, you know, like once, my, it's like what Kevin Nealon told me on the podcast. He goes, when you see someone who was on Saturday Night Live in the writer's room, or even if they just hosted it, you like look at each other, like you, you get each other. If you went through made to do this, like we get each other deeply. I am the first person to laugh or cry on those calls. Um, all right, well now it's 8.04. I think that it's time to start. Uh, so here we go. We're gonna start the way I always start, okay? We're gonna start the way I always start. So you're gonna close your eyes, close your eyes. Take a deep breath. First of all, thank you for doing what you had to do to get here. Just, just give yourself a little credit that you figured that out because we all have such busy lives and you got here. So that's awesome. Now I want you to ask yourself this question, such a good question to ask yourself as often as you, you want, as you go through your, your days and your life, what did you come here to hear? 
What did you need to be reminded of that you know already? What permission do you need? Good. Okay, so open your eyes. If you feel like sharing, obviously you don't have to, um, you could share that in the chat, what you just heard. What did you come here to hear? And notice I said, what reminder do you need of something you already know already? I really feel like we forget who we are. We, um, we make up a story about who we are. You know, I'm Kathy Huller. I'm five, eight. I have three kids and I live in this zip code. Da, 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 da. You know, I'm good at, I'm good at this. I'm not good at math. Like we, we make up these stories and we forget who we are. And we, we, we forget that there's sort of like the big eye, right? Really who we are, the essence, like our, our self, the true self. And then there's this little ego and um, the ego likes to be the boss. But the truth is that if anything I say tonight feels true, it's because you know that. And if you feel an aha moment ever, it's kind of like one of those, ah, I just came back home to my own knowing, to my own truth. So if I can be there to help you with that, that's such a gift. So let's see what you wrote. Sherry said, um, everything will work out for me, that I can do this. Carol, Carolyn said, I'm right on time. These are the things that people wrote that they, they came here to hear that I'm capable of building the life I want and deserve. It's true. How to go for it, that I'm good enough to make it. How to know and start my purpose. What the heck is my thing? Good question, Victoria. I want clarity on what I'm meant to do, that I'm worthy to live my life, my dream life. These are all so good. And by the way, Colleen is here. She said hello to you initially. She is the integrator who runs my whole team. And so I might be saying hello to her a couple of times, but Colleen, you could just keep, keep track of what you're seeing here in the chat, because um, we might want to refer to, to some of these beautiful dreams. So let me start by saying this. You're, you're super smart. You are sitting here tonight because you know that you're made for more. Type a one if that resonates. You know you're made for more. Yeah, you are. And there's so much beauty in the questions you just asked and in the dreams that you're daring to dream. Let me tell you a little bit of a spoiler alert. Your thing, the thing you came to the world to do in one form or another is to give your gifts away. This is serve. We crave making an impact. We are so thirsty to contribute. And we get caught up in this dance, like I said before, with this ego, where this ego likes to tell us a story about imposter syndrome and how we're not enough and how we have to really hustle in order to make things happen. Things are really hard. How often have you heard someone say some version of the thought that it's, it's really hard to make those things happen or you gotta be lucky? Well, what if I told you that it's so easy that we just skip right over it? You are the mystic. The portal to that expansion is right here. You, Dorothy, you click your heels. But what we're taught is not to trust that. So the people that came before us, they want to protect us. They want to protect us from getting hurt. You know what happens by the age of nine or 12 or 16, we go through the fire. Type a one in the chat if by the age of 16, you had been through something very hard, very significantly hard. Me too. I feel that. I know what that's like. So what we do as people 
is we get our hearts broken in pieces and then we make an agreement. It's a silent agreement, but the agreement is I'm not getting hurt again. So I will do anything to avoid rejection. I will do anything to avoid being in anything that's uncertain. Did you know that salaries are addictive? Do you know they find that certain things are actually addictive? They light up in the brain the same way addictive things light up. Did you know your iPhone is addictive? Do you know people are addicted to their iPhone? I, I think that I am because I like have to know where it is, right? It's like, I'm not addicted to my shoes. I'm not addicted to anything else. So salaries, it's interesting. So as people, we crave certainty, but we live for uncertainty. We yearn for something transcendent, for something bigger and more magical and more expansive than the predictable everyday mundane life. Isn't that why you watch movies or read books or dream or daydream? So that's a double bind, right? So real fast, for those of you who typed in the chat that you, you don't know who the heck I am, this is your first time hanging out, I'll tell you real fast my story and then we're gonna get into your story, okay? But what's nice about sharing my story is what we need as human beings is possibility because what great leaders do is they put glasses on us that we can see further. And we as people, just like when you're a little kid and you model the behavior of your parents, we reach for the highest branch we can see. And so hopefully tonight I'll show you a few branches and maybe you'll step out a little bit and maybe the view will be spectacular. Let's see, let's see what we could see. So I grew up like a lot of people with some drama. My parents were so unhappy. The house was not a comfortable place. I would hear my dad jiggling the keys to open the door and I would literally freeze. There was a lot of violence in my house. Um, I was, I, I was just so, um, I was so unhappy being home. I just dreamt all the time of being far from there, far from there, somewhere else. I wanted to just hop through the TV screen into everybody's living room, silver spoons and facts of life and everybody so that I could not be there. My sister and I tried to run away a few times, but we didn't get very far. Um, eventually my parents got divorced, which was a relief, but things went from bad to worse. My mom was really, really struggling with mental health and um, she wanted to take her own life. So that was a really, really hard time. And I'm really sorry for anybody who's had any kind of pain because you don't have to have the same pain to understand pain because we've all had pain. So we kind of get it. Um, what wound up happening is the one thing that I loved growing up was writing music and going in my room and singing. And I thought everybody wanted to do that. I thought everybody picked up anything that looked like a hairbrush or a, a highlighter or a spoon and it turned into a microphone. In any case, uh, I guess not everybody did. And I knew that one day I would maybe try to do that. I'd go out to the big city. And so when I was 23, I came out to LA and I told everybody, you'll see, you know, the kids that were mean to me in sixth grade. Oh, you'll see, you'll see, you'll regret it. I remember thinking that in sixth grade, like you'll see one day. And um, I was bullied in sixth grade. Um, I won the talent show actually. And it was a disaster from there on. The girl who lost, she hated me. She wrote this horrible note that I was, she said I wrote, I never wrote it. Anyway, nobody wanted to sit with me in the lunchroom. So I used to go into the, uh, the office and ask if I could help file papers because nobody wanted to sit with me. So that was actually another lesson. Like don't shine too bright. Like people don't like it, you know? So I, there was that. In any case, um, when I was out in LA, I was writing music and I had a, a rude awakening, which is that the music was pretty mediocre. It wasn't great. <laughs> it was pretty mediocre. Um, but I kept writing music. And um, at that point, I hadn't spoken to my dad in years. He had gotten remarried and remarried again. And who even knows? I wasn't at any of those weddings. And my mom was, I, I had to stop being codependent and taking care of her. So I came out here with nothing. And eventually, guess what? I got a record deal. Can you believe that? I got a record deal. I got signed to Interscope. And I actually, 
Um, I got signed twice, but just to make the story shorter, let's just talk about one. So I was actually with Ron Fair at Sunset Sounds. I can remember these um, espadrilles. Is that what they're called? I was wearing these like tall shoes with like blue and white polka dots. And Lady Gaga was in the studio recording paparazzi. And I was sitting there and I was like, oh my God, this is that moment. And about um, six weeks later, I was driving on the 10 freeway and Ron calls me and he says, oh, you're driving. I can hear you driving. Call me when you get home. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And I pull off. I'm like Bundy and whatever Olympic. And he says, we're dropping you from the label. So what did I do? I went and got day jobs and I started working wherever I could find a real job. And of course, everybody wanted me to get a real job. You know, everybody thought I was crazy. And my mom was so upset that I kept talking about how I was going to do what I love. She's like, it doesn't happen for people like us. She was so threatened. She was so scared because it would make her question why she didn't do all the things that she wanted to do. And my mom was in her high school yearbook, most talented, right? She had that senior superlative. She was the lead in every play and she never went for her dreams. Her dreams were dying inside of her. And I'm sure that contributed to my parents' life in so many ways. In any case, after working all these day jobs, I stopped noticing, but I became a different person. I started dressing differently. I started dating people that I didn't really like and was bored around. Uh, I was wearing high heels. I was blow drying my hair. I was so not myself. And one day I was walking and I saw myself in the elevator mirror doors and I just broke into tears. And I was like, I'm going to quit because, because I don't know where I am. And my soul is dying. Type a one in the chat if you've ever felt like that, like you are living someone else's story. Like this is someone else's story. This is not my story. Yeah. And the pain that I experienced as a kid, I was like, I didn't survive all of those moments to wind up doing this thing, which is like coming home from work and watching Law and Order and reading People Magazine and doing it again the next day. It was like, what is that? We don't do anyone any favors by shrinking. So I, um, I said, there's gotta be another way for me to write music. There's gotta be another way. And I want you to remember this. It's um, ask a good question, ask a new question, right? Change the paradigm. And so what wound up happening is I said, maybe there's another way. And as Rumi says, what you seek is seeking you. And I wound up picking up a billboard magazine a week later. I hadn't seen or anything like that. I had like kind of like rationalize how I didn't want to do anything with music. Anyway, I wound up reading an article about people licensing their music to film and TV. And I said, what if, what if I could write music for Grey's Anatomy, One Tree Hill, Pretty Little Liars. And so, and so I did. And I just focused all my energy on it. And I learned how to make a hobby into a business. And I wound up making a few hundred thousand dollars a year. No joke. Did that for a decade. Would write music, pitch music, write music, pitch music. And I wrote songs for shows like Pretty Little Liars and Switched at Birth and One Tree Hill and Younger and ads for McDonald's and Coca-Cola and theme songs for Netflix and movies, things that you may have seen. You might go, oh yeah, I kind of remember that song. Whatever. I did that. It was really fun. And I had a baby and I had another baby and I got married and I couldn't believe that I was able to make all this money a kid who ate hungry man dinners and lived in an apartment. Uh, here I was like being able to help buy my family a house. But what didn't, what I didn't expect to happen is what happened next, which is I just kept saying yes. I just kept saying yes to showing up wherever there was a gift that I felt I could give. I just wanted to serve. I just wanted to be available. And so what happened was my songwriting friend started to say, how do you do that? How do you do that? Can I do that? Can I do that? And I was like, yeah, well, let me show you. So I would sit down with people and I would tell them what I knew and people would be so excited, right? See a new possibility. And they would say, really, do you think as a songwriter, I would be able to make a little money because I hate my day job. And I'm like, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you reach out to this person? And why don't you do it? And I started to teach workshops while I was still songwriting and I called it six figure songwriting. It was just what I called it. I started in my living room. I did a few workshops. Then I rented a little space. I found out that theaters are usually not, they're dark during the day. They're not being used. So I was able to rent a theater for 50 bucks and I would fill it with like a hundred people. 
and they would all pay like $50 to come. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe how much I'm making. This is crazy. And people were enjoying it. And next thing I did is I did a webinar online. I was so reluctant. It took me two years to finally do it because I thought, you know, our thoughts really can sabotage us. And I thought doing something online meant becoming something gross, like that I didn't want to be. I was like, well, why can't I just use the technology, but be myself? And so I did it just like this. Like I don't use slides. I don't plan it out so much. I'm just like, I'm going to show up. And it's amazing what happens when you drop into an open heart and you're genuine and you make an actual connection with a human being, right? People are not logical. We are biological, right? We have dopamine and serotonin and we connect. And when you connect, that's as good as gold, right? And so I liked it and I did it and I did it just like this. I was pregnant with my third daughter. This is five years ago. And at the end of the webinar, I said, I'll teach you how to license your music. I'll teach you what I know. It's a thousand dollars. At the end of that evening, 147 people bought the class. So I made $147,000. Then one of my students, Amy Loftus in my class says, you should start a podcast. This is really, really good. You should, you could teach so many creatives how to be resourceful and figure. I was like, really? That would be fun. At this point, I had three kids. I said, well, I'll never have the time. So I may as well do it now. You know, you want something done, give it to a busy person. So I started a podcast and four years later, as I said earlier, we are at 24 million downloads. That podcast has turned into uh, one of the greatest giftings of my whole life. I have grown so much. I have, I feel like I've gotten a doctorate, like a PhD in entrepreneurship and success and grit and resilience because I've been able to interview everyone from Seth Godin to Matthew McConaughey to Priyanka Chopra to Dr. Phil to Barbara Corcoran. I mean, I've like interviewed all of these people, Adam Grant and all of these people whose books I've read, Malcolm Gladwell, I've like just been, I've been having a front row seat. They've like poured into me. So I've grown so much. We've done almost 500 episodes and I started helping people right away. Within 18 months of doing the show, I started to put together workshops and say, okay, this is it. I'm going to help you quit your job. I'm going to help you be alive. You know, what's the quote? Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive because what does the world need? People who come alive. And that's really, this is the song. This is the greatest song of my life I've ever written. This is the song for my mom. This is the song for my mom. This podcast is the song I'm writing for her. This is the melody. This is the lyric. It's, that's a cautionary tale. Don't let your gifts die inside of you. Let's go right? So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to try to unpack for you some of what I've learned along the way and also just give you love because it's something I like to do and it's free and it's genuine. Right before I turned on this Zoom, I was listening to Don't Stop Believing because it was still on my iTunes because we listened to it in my class last night and it's the Glee version of Don't Stop Believing. How many of you our sucker for acapella versions of things. Um, pentatonics, amazing, all that stuff, so good. And, you know, there's so much going on right now in the world that's so heartbreaking. And here we are, you know, with so much, right? We have, we have Wi-Fi, we're sitting here, we're free. Think of the women right now in Afghanistan, how they feel for one second. So I was crying right before we came live because I feel like it's such an honor, it's such a gift to to be a vehicle to really love people into life, to really help you for a second, to see a break in the clouds, to remember that you've been given a something and you know it. And it doesn't have to matter if it's Serena Williams something or if it's LeBron something or if it's Beyonce something, who cares? It's your something. And I say this all the time, but you are the missing puzzle piece. What the world needs more of is you. What you need more of is you. What's really going to fulfill you if you're feeling unfulfilled, if you're feeling lonely, if you don't feel the sense of love in your life, give it away. Go give it away. You want to feel less lonely? Go talk to your neighbor. Give it away. You want to feel more fulfilled? Find some way to be generous with your gifts. So let's talk about what your gifts are. Number your paper, take out a piece of paper and a pen, number your paper one to 10. I want you to write this down. 
If I didn't have to be perfect, I would. If I didn't have to be perfect, I would. What are things that you would do if you didn't have to be perfect at them? What are the things that you would do? Paint, bake, connect, hold space, start a membership, scrapbook. If you didn't have to be perfect, what are the things that you would do? Okay, so now I'm going to give you a few more seconds. You're going to fill up that list. If I didn't have to be perfect, I would this. If I didn't have to be perfect, I would that. Okay. So just looking at the list real fast, okay, without having any kind of imperial, you know, understanding of what's right and what's not, it doesn't matter. Just at first glance, which one of those things are you going to circle right now that for some reason at this moment at 8.25 p.m. Eastern feels the most expansive? Circle it. Trust your intuition for one second tonight. Which one? And write it in the chat. Miriam said, start my podcast. Victoria says, write, write, write. Write a book, Sarah said. Write. Oh my God, a lot of writers. Paint. Start my Etsy shop. Sing. Podcast. Author. Build a space. Teach art classes, work outside, dance. Yes, 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 yes. Write the word yes next to it in all caps. Yes, it feels so good to say yes. You know what Cheryl Hines taught me? Cheryl Hines, she's on my sh favorite show, uh, Curb Enthusiasm. She was on the podcast the other day. She said, I learned so much in, from my life because of improv acting. When you get on that stage, you don't have expectations, but whatever comes to you, you just say yes. Yes. And from there you discover, oh my God, so much. Okay. So yes. Great. So now why are you not doing those things? We're going to come back to this. We're not diving into this yet, but why are you not doing that? Let's say you just wrote what you wrote, write a book, start a yoga shop, whatever you wrote. Why are you not doing it? Write it down. Fear, fear. I'm afraid. Money. Okay, Colleen, I want you to write these down. Fear and money. Fear, lack of money, money, fear. Oh, so good, you guys, so good. I can actually help you with this. Fear, overwhelm, finances, fear, money, fear, money, fear, got it. Lack of education, that's a different one. Time, money, fear, time, overwhelm, ego, lack of qualification, focus. Okay. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. Hold on to that. Let's talk a little bit more about you, your story, okay? So how many of you have heard this word, ikigai? It's a Japanese word, ikigai. Maybe you've heard me say it. An ikigai is the point where three lines intersect. Three things come together. Three rivers converge. They have that in Pittsburgh, right? Three rivers. Um, so what are they? What do you love? This is... This is the Japanese word ikigai, which stands for what you are put in the world to do, okay? Your purpose with a capital P. What do you love? Number one. What are you good at? Number two. And number three, what does the world need or want? What do you love? What are you good at? What does the world need or want? You can write that down. Okay. Okay. Now let's go one step further from here, okay? So we're gonna come back. These are just some pieces. We're just kind of taking some pieces out and then we can try to see once we put, you know, you flip all the pieces over when you start, I don't know how you do a puzzle. What I do is I take all the pieces out of the box, flip them all over. Then I usually get all the, the, the end perimeter pieces. You guys do that. And then we start to put the, so right now we're taking all the pieces out of the box. We're flipping them over and then we're gonna see if we can put them together, okay? So here's another piece in the puzzle, okay? I have interviewed almost 500 people and I can tell you they all fit into one of five categories. That's good news. There's a little bit of a pattern. So let's talk about these five categories so that you could try to identify what maybe is the answer to what you're supposed to do, okay? So here are the five categories, makers, 
and we'll go over what they are. Makers, teachers, curators, investigators. I'm going to explain these. Don't worry. And the last one is servers, people who serve, people in the services business, services, servers. So we're going to say makers, teachers, curators, investigators, and people who do a service, servers. So let's talk about what those are. Well, makers make things. Okay. So a maker, that's the songwriter. That's the screenwriter. That's the sculptor. That's the ice cream maker. That's the makeup maker. That's a maker. Teachers teach things. Maybe they teach screenwriting. Maybe they teach photography. Maybe they teach you how to do makeup. Curators. Curators might say, well, I don't want to take the pictures and I don't want to teach you how to take pictures, but I sure as heck would like to Oh, I'd love one day to have a gallery or to just put it together a show of all these different female photographers as a curator. Curators might say, I don't want to make the food and I don't want to teach people how to make food, but I'm such a foodie that I would love to put together some kind of a, a festival where people who make local batch goods come together and share the popcorn they make and the, the maple syrup they make and all that stuff. So we have makers, teachers, curators, investigators. Investigators are people who say, you know what? I'm so curious that if I could get paid to just be curious all day, I'd be in heaven. Malcolm Gladwell, who I mentioned before, he was on my podcast last year. He is an investigator. He is very much a curious person. And a lot of people quote him so often because his books are so, so successful that people think he wrote this research on the 10,000 hour rule. How many people have been like, oh, Malcolm Gladwell said, well, no, he said it, but he was quoting research, right? He investigates research. He's not, he is not a psychologist. He's an investigator. Gretchen Rubin is somebody who people say, you know what she says about happiness, right? Well, she's not Dr. Martin Seligman. Dr. Martin Seligman is a professor of an expert in positive psychology. Gretchen Rubin is actually a person who said, I am actually unhappy. She was on the podcast too. And we talked about it. She's like, I'm not a happy person and I would like to be happier. So she went on a search for how to be happier. So she took everybody with her while she investigated what would be the things that would make a person happier. You guys getting that a little bit? Okay. And then the last one is a server, a person who loves to do the service. So there are people who are like, I don't know. I, my sister-in-law is like this. She's like, I just get so relaxed and so excited when I go in someone's house and I organize stuff for them. Like she loves all of it. She could organize papers in someone's office. I'm like, oh my God, the papers. I hate even knowing I have papers. I don't want to even look at them. <laughs> She's like, oh, I pulled in my hand. Some I put in the shredder, some I put in an envelope. And I'm like, oh, she likes to go through bookshelves and color coordinate. I'm just like, oh my God, so not me at all. I am such a, I don't know what you would call me. Type B, not type A. I don't know what I am. Um, so she likes to do that service. What are other services? Some people like to do massages. I, I, I love getting massages, but I often think, how do they do this? Like I couldn't do it for more than three minutes. People sometimes like to cut hair. People sometimes like to do interior design. Oh my God, they want to be there looking at the room, moving angles. Da, 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 da. It's like, that's amazing. Okay. So you have right? Dog grooming. Someone just sent me a direct message. Dog grooming, that's a service. Okay. So those are the five things. Now, what if I told you that you could literally do those things? You could make a living doing those things. What we do is we overestimate what it's going to take and we underestimate what we could get done in one day. So I want you to, you don't have to tell me this number. You can keep it to yourself, okay? But I want you to write it down for yourself, okay? I want you to look at your own paper. I'm not asking you to put this in the chat, but look at like what you make at your day job, okay? And so you keep that number to yourself. 
I mean, you're obviously allowed to share whatever you want, but you don't have to share that. You write that down on your own paper and you're like, okay, so you, you're pretty clear what you make a month. It could be 6,000, 4,000, 3,000, $2,100, zero, whatever it is. I am telling you, as sure as I'm sitting here, that you could do one of those five things and it is realistic. It is realistic. What are you saying? What are you asking of the universe? I want to be Richard Branson next week. I want to own an island. It's like, no, you're saying, could I put an offer in the world and do something I like that the world needs that I'm good at? The answer is yes. Now, here's the thing. When you look at the Ikigai, what do you love? What does the world need? What are you good at? The thing that we hate hearing, but it is the truth, is that fortune favors the brave. And the bravest thing I've ever seen anybody do is step into the unknown. Because clarity is what everybody wants. Remember I said at the beginning, we all want certainty and clarity follows action. We only have the answer because we try things. Now, when I say fortune favors the brave, what I don't mean is that people should take the leap. I never say take the leap. I say build the bridge. Be smart. Right? Look at the calendar and plan your quit day. Maybe it's in January. Maybe it's in May. Maybe it's next August. But plan it and use it as a motivator. And while you have your job, you let your, you let your job be the investor towards your dreams and you start to get excited in order for you to figure out what you love. You're going to have to try a couple things. If I were to say to you, we're going to Faneuil Hall, anyone been to Faneuil Hall, Quincy market. So, um, Quincy market. So, um, you can get almost all, any kind of food there. Indian food, you know, sushi, Italian food. If you had never tried all those things in your life and I took you there and I said, which one do you want? You might need to try a few things before you knew that you really want grape leaves. You want Greek food. You never had it. You need to try a couple things. When you ask, I asked this of Barbara Corcoran, when you ask her, how, does the, how do the people on Shark Tank know if they should make an investment in something? She said, we ask the same questions to the people who show up. Is there a market for this? Will somebody pay for this? So now let's ask that question. In the Ikigai, it doesn't just say, the Ikigai is what you love to do. It doesn't say that. It says, what do you love to do that the world also needs? Now that's a gift. Because what we know from studying human beings is that what makes us happiest is doing things that impact other people. Let me bring you back to Dr. Martin Seligman because I mentioned him for one second before. Dr. Martin Seligman is like the father of psycho positive psychology. And they did a study at Harvard where they brought people in who wanted to be happier. And he said, great, we're going to spend a week together. And I want you to make a list of all the things you love to do and all the things you love and all the things you love to eat and all the people you love to be around. Make a list. Everything that makes you happy. This is your best Christmas ever. We're granting all your wishes. Genie in a bottle. So they gave people money for a shopping spree, a trip with their best friends, the best night's sleep. They didn't have to go to work. They gave people everything. And they did all of these tests on them at the beginning and at the end of the week. And at the end of the week, they found people were not happier. There was really no change. Interesting. So he said, if you wouldn't mind, come back next week. People came back the next week. And he said, let's try something different. Instead of giving you money to spend on yourself, I'm going to give you money. I want you to give it away. Instead of you going and having your favorite foods every week, every day of the week, I want you to go give food to other people. I want you to hold the door for other people. And on and on and on and on it went. 
And when people came back at the end of the week, and of course I'm leading the witness here, do you think they were happier? They were happy. Because what we long for, people wanna be seen. What we wanna be seen for are the unique ways that we affect this world. We want to be needed more than even loved. We want to feel like what we do, it mattered, that we left it better than it was, that somebody else is better off because we exist. So it's an amazing gift to flip the way you think about how you're going to choose what your dream path is. And you say, what lights me up? Now, that's the thing. It has to light you up because you have to have juice in order for you to be willing to show up for it. But what thing do you like doing that the world actually does need and does, does want? The other thing to think about is there are things that are hobbies that light you up, but you're not sure if anyone needs or wants it. Well, the question that we're talking about tonight is how can I do a dream and get paid to do something that doesn't make a job? Well, as soon as there's money involved, that means someone gave me that money. That means somebody gave me money, which is equal to value for them. It's a way, money is a story, right? We put it on paper, $10 of value, $50 of value, $1,000 of value, write a check, it has a certain value. So people give me things, this is their value that they have in exchange for things that they value. So once it's a business, it has to matter that somebody else needs it or wants it. When we have two words, write it down, radical empathy, radical empathy, we are able to build a business because we're able to solve problems. Now I want you to know something that's very good news you can absolutely figure out how to make a living doing what you love and still caring what somebody else needs. Today I interviewed for the podcast, you'll hear it soon. I interviewed Brandy Carlisle on the podcast today. And the very first thing she said to me is that more than anything creative, she values people. She has so much empathy that she can't help but think of the collective every time she writes a song. So it's not just her song, it's our song. You know, when you're at a concert and the guy or the girl is singing whatever, and then they finally sing, Paul Simon finally sings, Call Me Out. And you're like, everyone dances because everyone knows that one. And then he plays these three new songs. You're like, mm, go back, you know, play Feeling Groovy. Like we can all sing along to that, you know, play Bridge Over Troubled Water. It's our song. In that moment, everyone's in it. So we need to get that that's not selling out. That's the whole deal. Now, what I didn't say is that because Brandy is somebody who has such a capacity for empathy, she decided to do something with the empathy that she doesn't like to do. But she took the thing she loves to do, which is to play music, and directed it towards serving, uplifting, helping other people set themselves free from shame, from whatever it is that she wanted to be talking about. That's powerful, right? Everybody's given a couple gifts in the bag. When you're born, you get a bag of stuff. Some people, there's a typewriter in there. Some people, there's a hammer in there. Some people, there's a microphone. You got a gift and you know it. Now, how do you use that thing, right? In a way that it's also someone else is going to say, oh my God, I'm going to pay you for that. So when I was writing music, I want you to hear this. I got dropped from the label. I gave up. I said, oh, well, that's it. You're either lucky enough to have somebody be your muse and invest in you, or you have to go do something you hate and sit at a desk and be unhappy. Those were the two choices. But again, I want to show you a different branch to reach for. So the different branch I understood was, wait a minute, the reason I was successful 
at licensing music to TV shows and movies and ads is because I did something that other songwriters just didn't think to do. I would call up, first of all, remember how you wrote before in the chat, why you don't do things. And one of the things was because you're scared. I know what it feels like to be scared. I know what it feels like to make phone calls, to pitch yourself, to do cold calls, to do sales things. And your heart is racing. I know what that feels like. And when somebody actually connected with me, I would do things that other songwriters didn't think to do. And I would say, what project are you working on? What story are you telling? How can I help tell that story? And people would say the same thing every time. Oh my God, that's so refreshing. Well, I'm working on a movie right now about sisters. I need a song about sisters. Well, Kath, we're working on a, uh, you know, an ad right now for Christmas. And it's all about like remembering the magic and we need a song with the word magic in it, but it, we, don't want it, we don't want it to be too corny and not too slow. And I would say, oh my God, thank you. Thank you. And then I would take this bigger story that I would get to be a part of and I would go to the studio and I really felt like it was better than Disneyland. And I would say, I could use my talent to write that song. And it was almost like shooting fish in a barrel. It's such a gross, weird expression, but it's all I could think of in the moment. And that's how easy it was. And I would just come right back and say, this is a song. You wanted a song about home? Here's a song about home. You want? Did it make me less me? I don't think so. I mean, I saw Waitress. How many of you saw Waitress on Broadway or heard the recording? I just can't imagine that anyone can look at Sarah Bareilles and say, hmm, you sold out. I know you. I've read about you. You don't have a baby. You weren't, you weren't beat up by some guy. So you wrote all those songs. Those songs aren't about you. You sold out. Not so much, right? Instead, she had the gift to use her talent to step into the story that someone else was telling. And oh my God, right? It's magic, magic. So the biggest thing that happens is we believe that in order for us to do all of these things, we already have to be clear that we're perfect at these things. And that is something that you need to fully embrace. You need to embrace that you have to be willing. Here's the deal. You have to be willing to do mediocre things. Sit with that for a second. How does that feel to know that your first podcast, your first email to someone, your first thing on Etsy, it will not be your best. How does it feel to know you're going to make some mediocre things? Carrie said, horrible, not good. Yeah, it's not, it's not a great feeling, but you've survived a lot worse. Where would Fred Astaire be? Where would Serena be if the first time she played and Venus wins the match and she says, oh, forget it. She wouldn't be Serena, would she? We should think of people who we admire right now. And as much as you admire them for their talent, Next time you see someone like Lady Gaga or Brene Brown, anybody who you think has mastered something and so talented, right? Someone's a great writer, a great speaker, a great whatever. I want you to admire them also for being willing to tolerate not being perfect for a while. That's really the hero. Can you imagine, I heard Ed Sheeran talking about his songwriting and he said, you ever go into a cabin and the, you know, you're staying with your friends somewhere in Vermont to go skiing and you haven't been there in a while and you go to turn on the faucet and the faucet comes out like some brown water. Well, you just let the water run for like 12 seconds and the water's clean. He said, that's how my songwriting was. He goes, I had to write my way through the brown water till it got better, better, better. And then it was great. How many times have you listened to a song and you go, oh my God, this song like takes my breath away. How many songs 
had to happen for that song to be written. That's the only analogy I use because that's my analogy. Because once I started writing songs every single week and month and they were all over TV and film and ads, people were like, well, you're just good at it. I'm like, well, I wasn't. I was pretty mediocre at it, actually. I got better at it. What we practice, we get better at. So one of the things that we practice is some pretty nasty beliefs that make the world feel really small. Some of those beliefs are, it's not possible. Some of those beliefs are, nobody's there. There's no customers, there's no money. People are so broke, nobody would pay me. Type of one if you ever thought any thoughts like that. We have to start by practicing different thoughts. The money is there, the clients are there. How about there's evidence that the thing I'm doing, people are doing. Imagine out of the entire world, whether you opened a membership for women who wanted to do creative writing or you um, sold a few things on Etsy or you um, organized people's closets, Imagine if out of the entire world, 200 people paid you $47. This is just random numbers. That's $9,400. So let's say you had, this is just so random, but let's say you had a class that was $47 or a membership for people who want a scrapbook that's $47. If you had 200 people in the whole world that's $9,400 a month. In 90 days, if you wanted to get 200 people in the world to buy $47 worth of something, in 90 days, that's two people a day. Two people a day. That's just a random example. I said to a friend, what if you taught a class in playwriting and she said, because that's what she wanted to do. She's like, I could never leave my job. I could never leave my job. I said, okay, let's say you had 15 people pay you $50 and another 15 people. So you had two classes of 15. That's $750 a class. That's $1,500 a week. So if you taught two classes on a Sunday, two different hours, even an hour and a half a piece, three hours, 90 minutes, whatever it is, you teach two classes, 15 people a piece, for $50, that's $6,500 a month. She's like, hmm. My best friend, everybody knows the story, I tell it a lot, but it was she was on Shark Tank and she did a deal with Mark Cuban. She actually got more than the money she asked for. In her own house, she just started tinkering around with vegan recipes and she came up with vegan, vegan corned beef. And she took, a, she took a step into the unknown and she went in front of a local grocery store and asked a bunch of people if they wanted to try it so, because her family liked it, but she wanted to see if strangers would like it. And then she made a list of where could she have people try this. And she made a list of the delis in LA and she called all the different managers to see if they wanted to taste it. And some people were like, don't call here during lunch. And some people were nice. And she had one deli manager try it and said, well, let's see, fine, we'll buy a few pounds. Well, what wound up happening is she was able to say to them, you know, hey, when people come in here late at night, when people come in here during the day, they might want to see a vegan option. More and more people are vegan. If you don't have anything vegan on your menu, you don't look pretty cool. Anyway, they started to carry it. She had 10 delis, 10 customers, each, each deli buying about 100 pounds, 100 pounds every couple of weeks. Then it turned into, well, where else are their mouths to feed? She's like, well, what if I called Dodger Stadium? What if I called the commissaries at Fox and Netflix and everything else? And on and on it went until she called Whole Foods, Subway, Quiznos. She's making multi-millions. She has three kids. It's amazing. Now she doesn't just have vegan corned beef. She has vegan corned beef, turkey, steaks. It's amazing. And she's helping some animal friends as well. Howard Schultz was on my podcast. You guys know who Howard Schultz is? Type of one if you know who he is. He 
started something called Starbucks. So Howard made me cry talking to him because I know Starbucks. I've heard his name. I didn't know him. I didn't know that he grew up in public housing. I didn't know that they grew up below the poverty line. I didn't know that his father was hurt in the war and they lived in a 300 square foot apartment and he used to do his homework in the stairwell because they had no space. I didn't know that he got a scholarship playing football to Northern Michigan because he played outside so often because there was no space inside on the concrete in Brooklyn. He played football because there was nowhere else to go in the house. And that's why he got a scholarship because there was also no other way to go to college. I didn't know that he lived at the last stop of the L train in Canarsie, Brooklyn. I didn't know that they used to have Jewish family services bring them food because they literally were starving. I didn't know that his mother used to look him in the eyes and say, we, we live at the last stop of the L train, but you don't get off here. This is not your last stop. Howard, you look at me, you don't get off here. He told me that and we both like burst into tears. He goes, I never cry telling this story, but you're really listening. I was weeping. This man makes $4 billion a year. Do you understand how much money he has? He came from zero. What happened was he stepped into the unknown. Everybody wants a master plan. People say to me, I have a business problem. I go, no, you don't. It's a courage problem. It's the courage to tolerate being mediocre. It's the courage to test things. It's the courage to try. It's the courage not to know. It's the courage to put yourself out there. So what happened with Howard Schultz is that he was working at a coffee grind company when coffee used to be a thing that people would sell to big office buildings and people would have it in their coffee makers. There was no Starbucks. There was no corner place where you could get all the different kinds of Frappuccinos that didn't exist back then. And he had never been out of the country and he was sent on a sort of like a conference by this coffee company to Italy. And he was just completely enchanted because he had never been out of the country and he was walking through the city streets and he saw people sitting at cafes with little cups of espresso. They would just linger and they just make space for each other. And he came home and he said to his wife, he's like, we don't have that here. Everyone's always busy. People are in the office or they're home, but they're not sitting. They don't just sit. If they go eat, they go eat bacon, eggs, ham, you know, they don't sit over a little tiny nothing and just sit for the conversation. He said, we should have that here. And he had never been excited about anything. And he said, I'm going to do this. And long story short, he bought this little coffee grind company called Starbucks. All that Starbucks did at that time was they were a little tiny company, a little warehouse in Seattle that packed coffee beans. That's all they did. There was no Starbucks you could go into. He, long story short, raised a bunch of money, was able to buy this little coffee grind business and open up the very first Starbucks. And now, does anyone know how many Starbucks? there are? Type it in the chat if you know. Take a guess. So there are 34,000 Starbucks, and that doesn't include the Starbucks that you find in airports or Target. <laughs> there are so many Starbucks. There's now so many Starbucks that there's a Starbucks inside the Starbucks, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. And he is famous for giving people health care, which is amazing. People can get a part time job and get health care. And he's famous for giving people a college education, which is awesome. So, what does that show you? There's some possibilities, right? My friend Jamie Kern Lima, how many of you know who Jamie is? Jamie sold her company, It Cosmetics. How much did she sell her company for? 1.2 billion with a B. She was a Denny's waitress. She was never the girl who anyone told was ever gonna be on TV. 
as a model, a girl with rosacea, a girl who never fit into size two jeans. She sold her company for 1.2 billion. Next time you look at someone and you think that the reason why they made it is because they had money or they had resources that you don't have, look for the evidence of the people where that's not the case. That's not the case. My friend Alex wrote this book called The Third Door. And he interviewed Lady Gaga and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Maya Angelou and Larry King and a bunch of other people and Steven Spielberg. And he said, all of those people, there was no help. There was no resources. There was no VIP list. So he said, I sat back and wondered, so what is it? What's the through line? Maya Angelou, Steven Spielberg, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, all these people, like what was the through line? And what he said is, I realized it's like a nightclub. You go to the nightclub, there's a line wrapped around the block. Everyone's just waiting, 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 hoping that they get in, hoping that they get in. That's the first line. That's the first door. That's the sucker's bet. The second door, the second line, that's the folks that are on the VIP list. Your last name's Kardashian, right this way. Your dad owns the building next door, right this way. VIP. He goes, that's even worse than the sucker's bet. That's like the most unfulfilling line. Then he said, there's a third door because he said, everyone who's ever looked at a building knows there's another way in. There's a side door. There's a kitchen door. There's a, there's a door on the back. And he said, the, the brilliant thing that he realized that all of these people did, it wasn't finding the door. He said, because everyone knows there's a door, you can find the door. He said, the hardest part is leaving the line because we are so brainwashed to believe that we can't leave that line. And we want the approval of the people that were around so badly that we don't want them to look at us and say, look who, look who thinks that she's gonna leave this line. Look who thinks she's leaving this line. So I could literally give you examples in fact, my podcast, the prerequisite to be on the podcast is you cannot be from the second line. So if for some reason your parent is this person, not a fit. If for some reason you were not a fit, because I wanted to do a podcast where every single guest would be evidence, evidence of what you really need to figure it out. And I want you to know this. And we know this, by the way, we know this for a fact because there's science to prove it. The greatest resource that you need in order to make this magic happen, it's not the money and it's not the time. It's the greatest resources that are inside of you. Compassion, empathy, that fire, passion, grit. And the biggest one is the rarest one. It's an open heart. When you walk into a space and your heart is open, you're a magnet. Everything good, every opportunity. So as I said to you when we started, maybe we're so committed to the idea that it has to be hard, that it's so actually easy, but we keep skipping over it. When was the last time you made a little space to trust your intuition, to stir the dream pot? So let's go back to those dreams that you said that you had, the things that you said that you would do if you didn't have to be perfect. So first I want you to know that if the thing that most people crave deeply is connecting, true connection, authenticity, not feeling alone, if they really just wanna feel connected. If what the world is missing the most right now, I can tell you is empathy. We live in an empathy deficit. Then I think if you became more concerned with how you could give your gifts away, then focusing on yourself 
And whether you're smart enough or good enough or pretty enough or tall enough or rich enough or young enough, maybe you would say, well, what if I could impact one person today, three people today? Maybe just having an open heart would actually go a long way. We make it so hard. Like, oh my God, I could never do that. In order to do that, I would need three degrees. In order to do that, I would first have to have $400,000 in the bank. It's like, what are you talking about? It's a human business. Sales is not a numbers game. It's a people's game. So let's go back to those things that you wanted to do. Picture yourself a year from now. It's August 17th, 2022. And you're doing that thing. Tell me again in the chat. If you could stir the dream pot. If you had the Herald and the purple crayon, if you had that purple crayon and you could just make it so. If you could be in the state where you are the equal vibration to what that is and you could just see it made manifest. What is it? Making wine, sing at the Grand Ole Opry, build a garden, retreats, people, weddings, successful author. That's how you know that that's a compass, right? That's a compass. And when I say it's a compass, I mean, if the dream is in you, it's for you. Here's how I mean it. We can only see what we can see and we don't see well. If I held up my camera right now and took a picture, my camera will actually see what's here. I won't because I have a cognitive bias. So I'm gonna see through the filter of my lens what that blue reminds me of. If I walk in a room and see a guy who's tall with such and such hair, I might, rem might remind me of my father, right? We don't see what's there. No, we see what we look for the evidence of. So let's say we have a dream. I had a dream. I was going to go to LA. I was going to get a record deal. So you could say, well, you had a dream and if the dream is in you, it's for you. That's not true. That's not what happened. No, 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 no. Hang on a second. Because that was the only branch I could see. But by pursuing that branch, it led me like the game of like hotter, colder. It led me to where I was really supposed to be. Who's ever seen Field of Dreams? The guy's like, I wanted to play baseball, right? Such a great movie. And he gets this chance. I'm going to totally spoil it for you. But it's so many years old that if you haven't seen it, you deserve the spoiler. <laughs> and he goes out and he's finally going to get to play with all of the legends, all the greats. And just as he gets up to bat, oh, it's going to make me cry. This little kid falls in the stands. And someone says, is there a doctor here? I'm literally gonna cry. And he runs over. And Kevin Costner's character goes, oh my God, I can't believe you missed that. And he goes, no, you get it all wrong. If I would have played baseball, I would never become a doctor. It's an amazing moment. If I would have gotten my dream, I would have toured around the world. I would have worn these clothes. You should have seen what they wanted me to wear. I never would have married the guy next door. I wouldn't have my three girls. And I wouldn't be sitting here and I wouldn't have the opportunity to get the letters from hundreds of thousands of people every day saying, because of you, I opened a bakery. Because of you, I learned how to play the violin. I bought my mom a house. I took the job in Paris. We can't see. 
We don't really know. But the truth is that I said the truth to you, fortune favors the brave. And when you're brave enough to take this one little clue, you go all in. Whatever the door is, will open. That's the truth. We live in this world where people are so, they're so busy. They don't have any time. And everybody, everyone needs an ROI. I'm not gonna waste time on that. What if nothing happens? What if it looks stupid? Well, if you're lucky, the time's gonna pass anyway. So why don't you give yourself a little grace and put something out in the world. And maybe by building these wooden tables, you're gonna get led to this woman who actually really wants you to build these wooden bowls. And next thing you know, you, you make these little figur figurines and next thing you know, I mean, Steve Jobs, for God's sake, started by taking a calligraphy class and he kept looking at these fonts. And he said to his best friend, wouldn't it be nice Everything in the world was beautiful. That's how it started. And his friend said, well, shouldn't it be useful? And he was like, what if it's just beautiful? That's amazing. And when you ask people why they love Apple products, they're so beautiful. It's beauty. And why is it designed? So that we'll make beautiful things. Make your own music, write your own script, take your own pictures, make things beautiful. Make things beautiful. That came from a calligraphy class. But as I said, everybody wants certainty so bad. That we refuse to be available for magic. So is it possible? Yeah. Are there clues everywhere? Yeah. Is there evidence that you can do this? Yeah. I want you to go home tonight, back to where you are. And I want you to find two examples, two people who do that thing that you said you want to do. Cause I want you to look at it. I want you to see it. It exists. There are people writing books. There are people living in Italy, whatever those people are doing, whatever those things you want to, you could find eight examples of that in the next six minutes on Instagram, just by searching a hashtag, you'll find people you never even heard of making money doing hand lettering, making money selling cheesecake, making money teaching people Taekwondo, whatever it is. So could you make money starting a podcast? Of course. Could you make money creating a group just for women to hold space for people who wanna talk about conscious parenting or a better sex life? Of course, do you need to be an expert? No, who said so? Go look for the evidence. Am I an expert? Is Oprah an expert? Where's Oprah's PhD? I bet she has like 19 honorary PhDs, but I don't think she sat down and got a doctorate. Not the last time I checked. Does that make her less? Where's, where, what PhD did Moses have? What, what are we talking about? Like, what, what is this? It's like imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome. It's like, mm, oh my God. So I want everyone to be quitters. I'm, I'm creating a movement. It, you might've heard me say it. I said it on Instagram, I said it on my podcast. I want everyone to quit. I want you to quit your job so that you can actually do your life's work. I want you to quit saying yes when you really mean no. I want you to quit building other people's dreams. I want you to quit being a people pleaser. I want you to quit constantly telling yourself that you can't have the life you want. I want you to quit a lot of things. And so I created, I created this thing called the Quitters Club 
And I'm going to tell you about it because I feel it's a moral obligation. I really do. My friend, James Clear, let me tell you this. He wrote a book called Atomic Habits. It was the number one New York Times bestselling book. Many, many weeks in a row, many weeks. I said, what's the most important habit? He said, you know, six months ago, if you would have asked me that, because people asked me that, I didn't know the answer, but now I know the answer. I said, what is it? Who you spend time with, he said. Who you spend time with, because we become the people we spend time with. So I've had it, especially this week. I see women and I feel powerless that I can't do anything. I want to be bigger. I want to be bolder. I want to create more of a fire. I need more people to rise. I need to see more women with checkbooks. I need to see more women millionaires. That's what I need to see. My friend, Rachel Rogers wrote a book called We Should All Be Millionaires. She's correct. There is no good reason why we're not unless we're just not fully rising, fully showing up, fully being on the hook, fully making a promise, fully saying, I will, I will take those photos for you. I will make them good. I will do what I can. I will invest in it. I am. It's not who am I not to do this? It's, it's not who am I to do this? It's who am I not to do this? Who are you not to do this? You've been given so much. You have a life force. You have Wi-Fi. You're running water. There are people who have none of that. Let's go not on my watch. So now I am unrelenting. So I do everything I possibly can. And I want to do more things. I'm on a mission. So we do this podcast comes out every single day. It's free. If that's going to get in your ears, that's going to be like the people you spend time with. Great. But you need the next thing because you don't just need information. You need transformation in order to do that. You need to put skin in the game. You need to start taking action. And so I have this big program called Made to Do This. It's not open right now. It's not available. I open it twice a year, sometimes three times. Usually now it's going to be like twice a year. So that's not available again until February. And I said, I have to do something. I got to get people forward, moving forward. We need momentum here. I read all these articles this week. How many people want to quit their jobs? You know what happened in the pandemic? We took a good look around and we said, I'm not going back to that. When life is this precious... I'm not spending hours of my life asleep at the wheel. The world needs a lot more light. It needs you. It needs you to get busy putting your gifts in the world. So we started this thing called the Quitters Club. And it's awesome. It's all of these workshops that I've done that you can sit and watch to help you find your thing, to build your audience, to put your thing in the world. Plus, it gives you a community of people who will celebrate you when you pick your quit day when you actually ring the bell and you don't have to even ring the bell. You can just say, I'm going to ring the bell. And here's all the things that we're going to help each other do so that we can actually leave our jobs and do the things that we're meant to do and make the world more beautiful. So I want you to go check it out because we can't be done tonight. So if you go to kathyheller.com slash quitter, you can check it out. Now, here's the cool thing. We are going to do a summit because we just did a summit last week and it was amazing. It was two days, two days. Don't keep your day job live. It was amazing. We're going to do a summit on abundance and money mindset and money because there is so much sabotage around something that's literally right here. We need to learn to open our palms and start to receive because the more abundance you take in, the more abundance you create in the world. The more cherry trees you plant, the more cherries there are for other people. The more money you make, the more money you can spend, the more money you make, the more people you can hire, the more women in Afghanistan you can help set free. This is no longer a choice. And that problem is a hundred years old. The, I don't know how to make money. I can't, it's like all day long, people are looking online for ways of spending money. It's like, I want to join this thing. I want to buy this thing. I want to do this thing. I want to go on this experience. Like it's all here. We need the courage. We need to get messy and get active and put our offers out in the world. So if you join the quitters club and you join it, I need to, I need to give you guys incentive to make quick decisions because we get so we are, we're constantly, constantly firing and wiring these fearful thoughts in our minds. And so we just, uh, it's like inertia, a body at rest stays at rest, a body in motion stays in motion. There's just been such 
resistance to moving into the more expansive place. And so I've got to up the ante. So I said to Colleen, I said, we're going to do a summit for anybody who signs up for the Quitters Club in the next 24 hours, you get to come to a day with me of a summit. We're going to talk about abundance and how to actually claim that. It's going to change your life. I don't just show up for things and like phone it in, right? We're going to exchange a vibration that's actually going to fuel you. That's the point. So there's that. And um, the thing that happens with the Quitters Club is that once a week, my team is going to be in there doing roundtables to help you figure out what's your thing. So you're going to have all these classes from me and then it's what's your thing, what's your thing. Now, here's another really cool thing. For anybody who wants to, in February, do my 12-week program, you will be able to apply what you pay for the Quitters Club towards that so you won't have lost anything. Instead, you'll have gained actually taking the steps now. So when you do made to do this, you're able to set sail. Made to do this is literally the best thing I've ever done besides my kids. I am there all in 12 weeks. It's not like somebody else. It's like you will have a breakthrough. You'll probably have eight breakthroughs. So that's the quitters club. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, when we say when we say that we don't have the resources, right? The truth is that the resources are always available. There was a student of mine, Nick, who was like, oh, I'm not going to take Kathy's program because I, I can't afford it. He had four kids. He was going to school and he was sitting at church and he worked a job and he was going and he was sitting at church and he said, I just knew I was listening to the pastor and I was like, hmm. Kathy's my person. I, I need to do this. And so he decided to take his four kids and do Uber Eats and Instacart two nights a week. And they would come in the car with him. And he said, this is what daddy does so that daddy can get to the other side. So he's actually living his dream. And a few months later, it was phenomenal. He actually got a song of his in a Nordstrom spot. That was one of my first students. And now he doesn't have a day job. He does music full-time. In any case, what's awesome about the Quitters Club is that you don't have to spend the money you would spend on me to do this. Um, but that's there for you. So the bottom line is you came here tonight because you wanted to be reminded that you were made for more. And you 100% are right. And you wanted to know what's this thing. So tell me now from what we talked about tonight, what would be one next teeny next step that you could take towards building that life, stirring that dream pot? Tell me in the chat, what's one next step? trying new things, writing a daily practice website. I'm going to tell you that the bottom line is, okay, we go back to the courage problem. In order for you to figure out what your thing is, you got to start showing up for people and giving your gifts away. You got to offer to organize someone's closet, see if you like it. You got to offer to cater somebody's birthday party, see if you like it. You got to offer to write that song and perform it. You got to get brave. You got to get messy. And here's the thing. If you want to grow, you should have something on the calendar that makes your heart beat fast. And the truth is that the real satisfaction in all of this is going to sleep at night and feeling that you didn't talk yourself out of your potential today. The biggest regret of the dying is people saying, I did not live life on my terms. How scary is that? And how powerful is it to let go of being a codependent and saying, you know what? I don't know that it's my job what everyone thinks of me. Some people don't like peaches. 
Some people don't like Jerry Seinfeld. There will be people right now already who don't like me, who don't like what I have to offer, who'll never like my podcast, never like my blog, never like my cooking. That's okay. How about that's okay? How about there's people you don't like? Let's be honest. How about there's music you don't like? How about you're not for everybody and they're not for you? Now let's just get on with our life and start showing up and start getting messy. And as hard as that sounds, it's harder doing that by yourself, which is why I created the space. It's very hard to do that in a vacuum, very hard. I'll say all the time things that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start you know, being extra nice to my husband. I won't be critical. And I talked to my friend and she's like, okay, today I'm gonna remind you. I'm like, all right, I need to be reminded. Right. Or I'm, I say, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to show up. I'm going to go to the gym. No, I'm not. But if I hire a trainer, I'll be there because she's waiting for me. I'll be there at 615. Accountability isn't a little thing. We are 95% more likely to get a result when we're kept accountable, not 8%, 95% more, percent more. And we do become the people we're around. So type of one, if you're like, I have this feeling, this sneaky suspicion that you, Kathy, when you talk, it's going in, it metabolizes. You're my person. That's awesome. That's such a gift for me. If I'm not your person, I want you to find your person, find your trainer, find the person who you'll show up for at the gym at 615. Because you need that person. Think about how many people it takes when Jennifer Aniston gets on that set, right? She's beautiful. She has a natural beauty and talent. Yeah, she also has a therapist and a trainer and all, right? We need to come together to support each other and to remind each other of what's possible and to keep each other accountable so we don't talk ourselves out because the fear is so, so heavy. Every single day we wake up in the past, our brain memorizes, or your brain is an artifact. Your brain has memorized everything you've been through and it fires and wires the exact same thoughts. You have 70,000 thoughts a day of which the majority are repetitive since your entire life. You have a negativity bias. They repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And then how you think determines how you feel and how you feel determines the actions you take and the actions you take determine the results, your life who you're with, what you're doing, what you're eating, what you're wearing, what's in your bank account, all come from what you did, which came from how you felt, which came from what you thought. So you can say, I got it, but nobody does. So I'm in a mastermind, right? I always have a coach right now. I'm working with someone. How many of you know who Byron Katie is? So we all have a person because we want that next level. We want to be able to see higher up in the branches. So the view is clearer. So if for some reason I'm your person, you should sign up for the quitters club because it's the cheapest, least expensive thing that I offer. And it's wonderful. You get a bunch of amazing master classes. Plus you get this community. Plus you can apply it towards me to do this down the road if you want to. And if you sign up in the next 24 hours, you're also going to get this summit. We're going to do on abundance on manifesting abundance in your life because there's no good reason. And it's a necessity at this point. Mother Teresa said, it takes a checkbook to change the world. Let's learn to receive. And if what's true that I said, radical empathy is at the heart of business, let's serve more people in exchange for more to come in and then more we can put back out. What do you think? The other thing we decided to do, if you sign up in the next 24 hours, is we're going to do another live, but it's going to be a Q&A session where we will be able, you will have the time to ask me questions based upon the master classes and the workshops that I'm giving you that you're going to watch. By the way, you also get my podcast course as well. Colleen, I'm going to put you up here in case there are things that I missed or anything else that you just feel like you need to share. Mute. Hey, everybody. Oh my gosh, that was so incredible, Kathy. Thank you. 
for all of that. I can feel just like all the feels, all the feels, everyone. And, you know, one thing Kathy has mentioned, and I think is so powerful, if you are in this space where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm ready. Like I'm ready for something different. I'm ready for something more. It's so easy when you get out of the energy of a space like this to sink back into all of your resistance again. And that's the beautiful part about the Quitters Club is not only do you have a community of like-minded people surrounding you every day, because let's face it, a lot of us, we have doubters who surround us in our day-to-day life because sometimes they're intimidated by us going after our dreams because maybe they're not, right? And it can be hard for us to keep staying true to our path when we don't have that community around us. So that's powerful. And then both Beth and I are in there every week to help you figure out your thing. Because sometimes we're like, well, no, but I'll start when I figure my thing out. And if you listen as Kathy's talk tonight, we don't actually ever figure it out. We'll just spin around chasing, you know, our tail if we try to just mentally get there. It's a process of moving. It's a process of giving those gifts away and getting that feedback and coming every week to those live calls with Beth and I, where we're there to help you iterate those ideas and improve them and tweak them and just get you moving, moving, moving so that you can ring that bell and leave your job. Yeah. The quitters club is basically your path to finally be able being able to quit your job. It's the things that you need. So inside there's all these workshops, the five steps steps to ditch your day job, the confidence code, how to overcome imposter syndrome, how to build an audience, how to sell what you do, how to create content and all of those kinds of pieces of marketing that you need. And then you have this community where we ring the bell and we celebrate people on that journey for making the decision that you are going to come out of this place and actually build your own business. You know, there's only two choices. You either have the courage to sell yourself or you work for someone else who had the courage to sell themselves. So it's, it doesn't make any sense, right? It's like, why are you working for this dude or this person? She's, well, she's all that. It's like, we have so much to give. And what you, what you come to realize is that it's such a gift, right? The person who made this shirt, the person who made this ring, I'm grateful. These candles, these flowers, they're not taking from me. It's a gift that they're of service, that they're offering up their ability to make candles that are non-toxic, to make arrangements that look like this. I get these every week fresh, right? These beautiful pieces of art in here, they add, yeah, solving a problem. Those cherries, those ceramic cherries, for me that day, I was looking for those kinds of things that solved a problem. I paid my money in exchange for those because they make me happy. The photographer who took that photo of my daughter over there, right? We get to realize that by selling things to people, when it really is focusing on these things that we realize that people want and need, it is a gift. It is the way the world goes round. And so you will learn how to find a thing that you do love, that the world does need. And then when you get into Made to Do This, it's a 12-week immersion program where it kicks your butt. And by the end of the 12 weeks, you go from idea to income. In the Quitters Club, you're able to start to take some action without throwing down as much money as it is to be in a 12-week coaching program with me. And you're able to just say, okay, I'm going to start watching this stuff. I'm going to start talking about this stuff. I'm going to start doing this homework. And you're going to get the momentum. I mean, think about how many ah ahas you had just from this conversation tonight. Type a one in the chat if you had any aha moment in the last 90 minutes. Yeah, because you're plugging back in, right? It's like a toaster that's not plugged in, an iron that's not plugged in. What good is it? When you plug in to the truth, to source, to expansion, to what's right here for you, you go, oh my God, why have I been sitting over here, stuck over here when it's right here? It's literally right here. So you're going to keep plugging in. You're going to plug in. And if you sign up in the next 24 hours, you're going to get a day with me. We're going to do a full summit all day long on abundance. You're going to once and for all take this belief that there's no money out there. There's no clients out there. There's no abundance of it. You're going to get rid of it because it really is toxic. It's not true. It's not true. Even in a pandemic, do you know how many people all day long are spending money? I can't even begin to tell you 
Mattel is saying they've never sold as many board games. Baking goods, they're saying they never sold as many rolling pins. Why? They're inside. Now people are buying things that they need for inside. People are redoing their houses. Oh my God, the stock market went up, not down. What are we talking about? It's like, we want to make it true, right? Because the ego wants to get in your way of just you being in the flow state. So the ego is going to say, there's no way you can do that. That's not true. There's a well, it is true. And when it is true, here's the bummer. Now you're on the hook. You got to go be brave. You got to go show up, get messy. Would you believe that I would have started a podcast in my closet four years ago and now it's an eight figure business? Is that a joke? I'm not even a famous person. I didn't have a Drew Barrymore on my title when I started. I don't have a name. I wasn't a thing. I just started it in my closet. Of course, I thought there's other podcasters of this. Who cares? When you know that you have an assignment, you have a gift you want to share. The greatest part of it, guys, you get to give your gift away. What about that? How good does that feel? And then, oh my God, now comes this other ROI. You actually get paid to do it. Double awesome. When we start living in alignment, when we start living with something called integrity, it pays well. Integrity means there's this thing nudging me. I'm actually going to go do it. And then what legacy do you leave for your kids who see you getting up at an open mic, who see you up at night, up early before you have to go to work, writing a book? John Grisham wrote those books before he went to work. He didn't quit his law job until he had like six bestsellers. You don't have the time? Of course you do. You know how many hours people spend on their phone? Very scary. What do you think is the average amount of time people spend on their phone every day? Yeah. It's hours, four to six hours. Let's be honest. We have time. We don't have courage. And the thing I want you to start saying to yourself is I have survived so many harder things. I have a story to tell and I don't need to be perfect. I need to be genuine. I don't need to have it all figured out. I need to show up and have an open heart. Do you know that by the end of August, if you were brave enough, you could do what Jenny did, have people start sampling the thing you make, whether it's your service it's your food. It's your thing. You start sampling it by the end of August, you're gonna go, I'm pivoting. I just got four more ideas. Great. Look how many times I've pivoted. I started out as a songwriter. I didn't even know podcasts existed. I don't even think they existed when I was songwriting in 2007. Maybe they had just started, never heard of it. So we are here to help. You know, there's a difference between nice and good. Try not to have a lot of nice people around you who just tell you what you want to hear. Have some good people around you who look at you and say, you are sitting it out. And instead of you complaining about this or that, the other thing, let's talk about what's really going on. There's something in you dying to come out. And boy, does it feel so good when you start to put it in the world. And maybe the hardest part is all this resistance. Maybe the doing of it is actually not that hard because it's not. I say to people all the time, I know you're so convinced that you can't build your own thing. You have to work for someone else. How much, have, how much of that did you try? Oh, uh, I, I, like, what, what did you do? What, what did you put out there? How many flea markets did you go to? I had Gray Malin on the podcast yesterday. Gray Malin, who makes all of those incredible pieces of photography, he started at the flea market in West Hollywood. Now he makes hundreds of millions of dollars making the most beautiful photographs. He took the first step. Wasn't a master plan. My friend Natasha Case from Cool House Ice Cream Sandwiches, she was like, I want to make ice cream sandwiches. Where can I sell them? Oh, maybe Coachella. Hmm. I need an ice cream truck. She goes on Craigslist. She buys a broken down mail truck that doesn't even open the sliding door of the mail truck. Didn't open calls triple a did you say that the first toe is free yes, free. how many miles is it oh up to two can you tow a mail truck to coachella 
Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Painted it, put an ice cream on ice cream cones on it. Stuck it in the dirt at Coachella. Had a freezer, little freezer box in front of the, the thing. Started selling ice cream sandwiches. Next day, there's a blog in LA all about these ice cream sandwiches. It's in this thing called Daily Candy, which was like a, it's like an LA kind of a thing. And right away, she decides like, maybe she should put up a Twitter account so people can find her. And now it's a multi-million dollar business. There's a lot of ice cream sandwiches in the world. She could have been like, why would I even bother to do that? Because there's already ice cream sandwiches. The end, I'll go live a life being frustrated. It's like, well, if you found a thing that you already like, there's already podcasts, there's already floral shops, there's already people making shoes. When Tamara Mellon created Jimmy Choo, she was well aware of Manolo Blahnik. She was like, oh, there's already Manolo Blahnik. Oh, and by the way, she made a pair of shoes, Jimmy Choo, that was $1,000. Did she say no one's going to pay it? She's like, well, there are different fishing holes. There's a customer for every price. There's a customer every day at the 99 cent store. There's a customer every day at Whole Foods. There's a buyer for everything. So she made those shoes. Now, when people buy Jimmy Choo's, do you think they feel like a million bucks? Do you think that there's an excitement? Do you think that they're buying Jimmy Choo's because they just need a pair of shoes? No, they could have gone to pay less. They could have gone anywhere. They're buying. They want an expensive pair of shoes because they want to tell themselves a story about what they're worth. So where would we be if everyone denied us that? Like everyone's denying us the, the ability to go and tell ourselves the story that we're going to treat ourselves to a nice robe or a nice hotel. Or We are just so in our head. And this is why every person I've interviewed on that podcast studies with somebody else, has a teacher, has a coach, has a pod, has a mastermind. Like we are here to level this up because this is what's in the way. It's not a shortage of money. I didn't have money or connections or anything when I went to LA. I didn't have it when I started podcasting. I could tell you story after story. It's about being resourceful. It's about opening your eyes. It's about saying there's magic here. The clues are everywhere. Let's go. How much can I get done in one day? If I've got 20 seconds of courage, how much could I get done today? Forget noodling on a website. Forget talking about it. What am I going to go do? Who am I going to talk to? I'm going to go out in the world and I'm going to attempt a thing and try a thing and listen and get feedback. And this is what we do in depth inside me to do this. And in the quitters club, you get to start building this. You get to start to do the things to get you ready for that. So it is very exciting. Um, Tell me right now. I just saw people saying you're going to be in there. Type a one in the chat. Tell us if you're going to be in the quitters club because we want to celebrate you. We want to celebrate you. Sherry's in. Juliana's in. Boris is in. Ava's in. Megan's in. Yes. And if you already signed up for the quitters club, we launched it like a saw. We just like quietly launched it a few weeks ago. Then you get all those bonuses too. Of course. Of course. As my mom would say. So we are so excited to have you sign up, go to kathyheller.com slash quitter. And for those of you who are listening, who are like, I'm on the fence. I don't know. I implore you to do something with this. Like oftentimes something happens. We wind up somewhere and we're like, I actually feel inspired. Do something with that, but you have to do something with it. Right? Please, please do. Please do. Like I didn't show up here tonight so that you would just like turn around and then let it go because I see you. I want you out there in the world. I want your podcast, your book, your shop, your things, your jewelry, your food. I want you there. I want you telling the story to someone else so that I rise, you rise, now somebody else rises. We have to just keep going. So the Quitters Club, you can join the Quitters Club. It's like $97 to join. That doesn't exist in my world. Up until now, I have made to do this. It's $4,000. I don't even offer things for $97 like that. It doesn't exist. So we're doing it. So you should join it. And if you think to yourself, oh my God, I don't have, I, I can't invest that in myself. It's like, oh my gosh, how easily if your child said, I want to take piano lessons or basketball, like you're going to be like, I'll figure it out, right? You got to learn to figure this out to make time for you, to make time for this stuff. So anyway, 
go to kathyhowcom slash quitter. If you join in the next 24 hours, we're going to give you that full day summit. I can't wait to do it. And you're going to get a special Q and a with me. We're going to go over the steps to ditching the day job. You're going to get that masterclass. You're going to watch the, it's your turn. You're going to watch the, how do you scale? You're going to watch there's Christy Wright is in there. Jasmine star is in there. Allison bird is in there. There's so much good content in there. And we're going to have a chance to go over it and talk about it. And every single week, you you know, Colleen, by the way, she's a smarty pants. She actually has a PhD <laughs> and she runs my team and she's brilliant and she's kind and she's going to be in there. Oh my God, for you to have that round table every single week. And Beth, these two women have been working with me. They know this work. So it's here for you. It's here for you. I had so much fun with you guys tonight. Thank you for bringing your hearts. Thank you for participating. I hope that you're walking away feeling a little bit clearer that you can see a little bit further. There's so much more that I want to pour into you. I think that that's as much as we can do in this time. We've already gone over time. Um, listen to the podcast. Follow me on Instagram. I post constantly. I'm at Kathy.Heller. In fact, go over there right now, if you would. Take a screenshot. We'll give away some swag. Take a screenshot and you can tag me at Kathy.Heller. That way I'll be able to follow you. I'll be able to say hello in the DMs and just say one thing that you got out of tonight because maybe that one thing is something that somebody else wants to hear and we can take this energy that we all just felt and we can kind of put that and we can reverberate that in the world. You guys, you have a gift. The world needs it. Give it away. I hope you all become quitters. I'd love to see you in there. Colleen, thank you for everything. And we'll see you guys inside there.